What's up guys? So we're here today with Ola Jaeger. What's up? Hey. You guys um, heard a lot about him from me telling you about you know his history in drifting or you know a small amount of his history in drifting. His car that he drives here from Norway that was Frederick's retired car but in reality it's Japan Auto's car that Frederick piloted and now Ola is kind of taking over ownership or you know borrow it and doing a whole lot of upgrades so it seems like it's almost turning into your car yeah we're trying to make it more reliable and i'm excited to get the car go in so we can focus on driving this year not too much uh repairing repairing or... and not get the time to do the setup on each race and uh, i think there will be a better season with a better car i think so i actually know so um but so first off gonna ask you the major question before we have Ola tell you all his background and everything about him we're gonna ask him what makes him drift I think that I follow my dream uh, I want to do this drifting and I do it for myself and I know it from deep in my heart that I want to drift so I feel like that I'm doing it for myself and it's a dream and that's why I drift like it's the only thing I breathe is drifting so I gotta do it. Without it, I'm not the same person. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, most of us can relate. We're kind of obsessed with drifting. So um, I know like your whole background, everything about you. Not your whole background, but I've asked you many, many questions over last year, and then we talk, you know, on the phone once a week almost. Seems like lately, um, car-related stuff. So I know about you, but these guys don't know about you. So. Why don't you tell us like what your first drift car was or your first experience that was like car related that might have not been drifting as a child and you know as, like how it progressed into where you, you are now. Of course, it's always been cars since I grew up, like since I was born. Uh, the first time I started with go-karting and did that for seven years. And then I saw Fred Gospel with an old BMW, like E30, drifting at the local track nearby. And uh, that Wait, was kind of the was way. Frederick? Yeah, Frederick. In that? In the E30. That's that was, what he started in? I think it had some Japanese cars first. Okay. But the first in drifting was a E30. When you saw, okay. Yeah, so that was kind of what we did on practice when it was uh, raining. We did all the like the Scandinavian flicks into the corners and going sideways. And it was nothing called drifting back then, but that we knew of. But when I saw Frederick did that, and I looked up to Frederick as a go kart driver, and he always was two years over me in classes in go-kart. And when I saw he did that, I was kind of hooked seeing him going sideways in an old E30. Mm -hmm. uh, I figured that must be possible doing it. It's just getting a car, yeah. right car. So, bought my first Supra, 18th really? birthday after. 18th birthday? Yeah, I was saving a lot of money and worked on cars and got a hold of some money. I loaned some money to get my first Supra from Japan Auto, actually. Oh. And uh, he told me like weeks after, you gotta get a roll cage in that car. And I was thinking just fun having a Supra, but then it started. First the roll cage, then coilovers, then a differential welded. Is that, that's the white Supra? No, it actually was a black Supra that became green. Where's that uh, one? It sold to another guy. Oh, so that, the white one's not here? No, that's the second Supra actually. Ooh. But always been Supras since 94 when the first GT game came out for Nintendo. That was uh, the first Castro Supra I saw. That's the one. That, That's the one. That, that Supra is like... It's one of the coolest. That one has like the hubs or even like it has like um, drop knuckles front and back. Like yeah. when you look at the profile view of that Supra, it's like the wheel is like... The fenders are all flat. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the wheel goes like, it ends like here. It's like the whole thing is just yeah, like just slammed flat. on the ground. So cool. Okay, we're getting sidetracked. Yeah. That's super. <laughs> so yeah. So, um, you you were saying like it was black, then it went green, and you sold it, but that that's where you started drifting. In yeah. The Supra basically. It's in the Supra. Oh my god. It was hard like financing stuff and figure out everything when I was 18. Of course, came from go kart. It was a pretty rough uh, competition. It was hard to be one of the best guys, and. I saw early that in drifting you didn't have to have the best car to start with. You can develop as a driver and develop the car with you as a driver. And it was 
not easier, but it was a way to become better and better, not spending all my money. Mm. So I kind of grassroots for many years, then I started competing in 2012. When was this, What when you were 18 and you got the first Super, what year was that? That was 2008. Oh, oh so your first Super was 2008. Yeah, so it's Wait, been 10 how, years, this is 10th year. How old are you? You're 28? 28, 28. Okay. Huh. So, Supra and then I bought a S15 Nissan. It's kind of a down period, will you say, maybe? Oh, but like, <laughs> and you didn't... Uh, I, can, I just drove it for a few gap years. And it's gone? It's gone. Okay. And then I had opportunity to help uh, Japan Auto build the Supra. I wouldn't know if it became my Supra, but at the time I started building it in my spare time and helping him build the car. And eventually he told me that, you want to try driving? Uh, you can drive that Supra, you try that Supra. Oh. So I kind of did and it's like the first race, I was a bit nervous and did many mistakes. But in 2012, I did the first full season in the Norwegian Drifting Series, Power Drift. Whoa. And That's we won cool. the first season. So that was. And then 13, you won again? No, then we drove Build Drift All Stars, three races. We came fourth in two of those races in Riga and Sweden. So that kind of made me realize that we have something to do in drifting and we're doing better and better each year. We develop <laughs> as a team with the cars, we know more. And um, I kind of was hooked since I got the first Supra, but when I saw that we can compete at high levels and do good, it even made me more competitive and made me more hungry of going to the US. Mm. It's always been a dream coming to the US and not just the drifting scene, but all the things around, I like it here. And if there's one place I want to make it, it's in the US. So FD is the most competitive series series, so yeah. Well, you're you're on the right path. You're gonna do it. Yeah, I'm here now, so it feels like I'm in the right place. Yeah, <laughs> you can do it. Well, so then now you guys know a little bit more about Ola. Um, he has exceptional English for it being his second language. I'd have to say so. Well, I'm trying. I'm getting better. Listen to you, everybody. Oh me? Yeah, that's probably not the best. I don't. <laughs> Everyone makes fun of my voice. Okay, so. <laughs> Now, we could go deeper into asking you questions like, what, what's the hardest part about drifting for you? If it be financial or mechanical knowledge with the car or driving or... Well, All the things. So, if there's something that would be hardest for you, what would it be? The financial part is really hard, of course. Uh, it was even hard when I'm back in Norway competing. But coming here is a whole other level, but it's more about planning things and getting to know people I think the hardest part is the financial thing, of course, but when I started drifting, the hardest part was to learn to how to not drive compared to what I did before. So like we're always searching for the grip in like if you go stock racing with cards and cars actually, but the hardest part is to adapt to the drifting scene, like doing the opposite of what you normally do and uh, searching grip in another way. Mm. So the whole thing was completely different for me, but after all, the financial part and uh, the setup part, we're still learning. You know yourself, the setup is so crucial and it's getting more and more important to have a right dial car. And I think we're always learning race by race, practice by practice, and a lot of theoretical, theoretical things comes into it as well. Yeah. Well, so... If that makes sense, that's kind of everyone's hardest thing is, I would say, financial. It seems like when, when we're doing these interviews. It's hard. Yeah, and then you're coming from Norway, and you're not just bringing yourself, you're bringing other people with you, so you got the cost of flying here, and then once you get here to where your car is, depending which round, you might fly into that round and I'd bring the car, but sometimes like you're doing multiple, t uh, like, and then you're renting a car after buying all the plane tickets and like ah oh, no, I can so. only imagine because it's hard enough for me financially and then I have like my home base here which is also my business so that part would like help it be less expensive for me and then I drive myself to like oh I can't imagine it would have been a lot harder if it's not for you and Frederick Aspo told me a lot of things Kenny Moen told me a lot of things they've been here before 
and uh, they recommended you and I'm glad that, you, that they did because if I met some people that weren't really liable, I wouldn't be here today. It would be one season maybe, hopefully, and that's it. So ah, that's the good thing. How people you trust, that's even more important than the financial part. I think uh, that's the most important thing. Well, thank you a lot. <laughs> All right, so looking back to last season with Ola, he did a whole season of Pro 2 last year, and he traveled um, in the trailer with me. We brought him to each round, and then we pitted together at the Pro 2 slash Pro 1 events that overlap, which there's four of, and then he also had us do work on his car and do the upgrades to his car, and you guys know that we're doing the upgrades. You've already seen the couple part videos that we've done on his Supra, but we also wanted to talk about Olog made podium last year. He got second place uh, in Texas. Form Formula D Texas, and that must have been crazy. How was that? That was a great ending to the season. After having all the struggles the first three rounds, uh, with small minor things like happening all the time. Even in Texas, we had some issues. A couple. A couple issues, like a small fire in the fan wiring. Oh, I forgot yeah. it was a fire. Nah, I forgot myself, but it smelled kind of weird. After I remember the first one, he, you replaced the fan, and it was like last minute, but you made it happen. It made it qualifying. We had the first run, we were early out because we had uh, not too good position in the championship, so we started off early and got a 87, so it was a good score. We didn't know, but it felt good, and that was uh, first place on qualifying. Then we felt that this is our weekend but you never know in drifting yeah. it's uh, very quickly over or you're on the podium so went into the top 16 and took out one after another in kind of strange ways because we were lacking much grip last year because of lack of power and everything so we kind of me and my mechanic Magnus talked about if we can do good lead runs let the other guys do the mistakes and that's a pretty rough thing to write to like rely on rely on yeah but it took us to a second place and that feeling that's was so uh, cool. i felt wait, wait less it was just flying on the sky over the track oh. i felt like i'm looking down on myself after all the hard work and all the small problems uh, it finally showed us and we showed the others that we can be up there if if the car works and if i'm dialed in so that was a great day and i was thinking that's about good. that day <laughs> even now it's like they gave me a good feeling for the next season. That's the 20%. That's the 20%. <laughs> we needed that 20%. Yeah. That's so cool. that was a good feeling and I love the track. And it's more compared to Norway, a flat track with normal corners, not the bank. I like going in the banks, but it was more like Norway and it didn't take me too long to dial in the track. Mm. It's more like a normal racetrack. So that was a good place. And we're going back this, this year as well. So hopefully we can do even better, a little bit higher on that. He can do it. You can do it. He'll do it. Uh, the next question we want to ask you is what were some of the sacrifices uh, that you have currently happening in your life or you have had in the past to let this dream happen? Or, like, I guess you have further goals than where you're at right now, which we all do, and you might have more sacrifices coming, but tell us a little bit about that. Of course, you can you can say that it's sacrifices, but after all, we're doing this because it's a dream, yeah. and it's not a sacrifice. But for many people, would say that yeah, living at home with their mom and dad, and that's good, but this, that's a sacrifice for many people. And uh, yeah, you have to, you can't have the same thing as others because you're doing one thing. You're not too, too much at home, and when you're home, you're thinking about drifting. Oh, I, I don't mean like. Sa Sacrifice in a bad way, but yes, like you trade one for the other. Like so, you're yeah. saying you're trading, like having your own place and maybe trying to buy a house or whatever that would yeah, be. Yeah, definitely. To live with your parents, like I would definitely live with my parents if they lived here. Yeah, of course. I just need to be in this part of the country, and they happen to not live in the state. But yeah, if I there was a way it's for nothing bad free rent, I would be <laughs> definitely doing it. Yeah. So okay. So. But, Equally sacrifice and choices, I would say. And like work, it seems like you're always working. Yeah, I sell cars and I like selling cars. So it's nine to five work, and then get back to the emails and trying to reach new sponsors and 
updating the certain sponsors, keeping in touch. Uh, and the good thing about being able to work in Norway, that's the time difference. We had nine hours different, we're nine hours ahead. So when I'm done working with selling cars, then you wake up, then I can call you. So it doesn't interfere with my, my job. So that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm constantly asking my phone, what time is it in Norway? And if it's like the right time, I'm like, yeah, he's awake. Yeah. Call you. <laughs> so that's about 24 hours. So I get back, get off the Norwegian work and back to the American drifting suit. <laughs> constantly. And a little bit of sleep in between. I got time. Ah, that's because you're like all in and you love this. So it's just not. Same as you. Yeah. Definitely. Same as all the others in FD, I think. I think so. Most of us are crazy. Some reason we're doing this, but so much fun um so then i have one more question for you well i got a cup i have a couple extras for ola but the the questions that i normally ask you know so when you started drifting was it i know that you're competing now we all understand that you're competing and you travel from a foreign country just to compete so we get that but was that always something in the plan or was drifting just like something you saw Osbo, Frederick Osbo doing in that E30 and you're like, okay, I already like cars. I'm already at the racetrack. So, you know, you're a car guy at the track, getting your adrenaline there, having a great time. But then when you saw him drifting and you went and then, you know, attempted it and started doing it, were you thinking about? It's always been competing or? It's always know. been that. Yeah? It's always been in me that I would, I would do drifting for fun, of course, but I don't think I would do it just for fun. It's always been since the first time I got into the drifting scene that I got to compete. And if I did the Norwegian series, then I got to do the Scandinavian series, then Europe. And it's always been, for me, very important to have progression, like going to the next series, next level, next level all the time. But you can say that's not a good thing, but for me, it's always been the one thing pulling me forward. Always. Why, would you, why would you say it's not a good thing? Oh, no, certain many, people aren't into it, you mean? No, I think that drifting is for all. It's like for the people who just want to have fun. Mm -hmm. 100%. I respect them as well. But there's also people like us who want to compete. And if we don't compete, we are not ourselves. So. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I have to compete. Like, so addicting. And then it's like that challenge that is extremely hard that you're putting in front of yourself. And then it's fun to like you know go after that challenge I, I can and do you know it. the feeling yeah. afterwards when I did something and, good and yeah definitely and some sometimes it's like he was the one that told me this he's like racing is 80% let down and 20% like success yeah. or is that how you worded it? my neighbor it? told me back yeah. in the days when I was a little kid yeah. I remember that a lot that racing is always 80% down yeah 20 percent positive yeah results. and i think it's even worse <laughs> i think last sometimes. year it was uh, showing us that i think yeah like i don't know i think certain years could be like the whole year is part of that 80 <laughs> percent but it's better having all the 80 the first season oh yeah. one season you had a pro one season uh, the pro two season and then you just can't do anything yeah I could the see. next year we do the 80 positive oh, <laughs> we, we aim do. for that yeah <laughs> uh, so, why Supras? What, what's the deal with the Supra? You're asking me why? Well, you don't have to, don't, don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> you like Supras? I'm not sure, but I love Supras. Yeah. So, uh, since that game in 94, it's like, you know, ever since it, that, a bit of Supra. And I, it, it started with like the shape maybe? Or? Yeah, it's the shape, but it was like the first race car, car I ever saw at the video game. Oh. I haven't been in the racetrack before that. And kind of saw a super after the first Fast and Furious movie mm -hmm. in the city where I live. It was the Japan Auto. Tomoe got the first car in from Japan. Mm -hmm. and it was like a train following him to the gas station. <laughs> he saw him on the other side of the town and it drove after to watch him fill gas. Yeah. And he just followed the car. <laughs> and ever since it's been like in Norway, it's not many supers on the road. And when you see one, it's always been special. So mm -hmm. I would, at the age of 15, even to sit in the super would be dream come true and it's always oh, been super too. I like the shape I feel like they could be made last year or 94 it doesn't matter they look like timeless yeah they will always be good looking especially the hips yeah really it's something weird about it because there's cars that I used to think that same thing about and over the years they faded out I'm like no nah, it's not quite doing it for me anymore but <laughs> the Supra I'll like I'll follow Renee home 
and she's driving her super home and I'm in like the van or the truck and I'm just like Oh, same thing you were yeah. saying the other like day. Like yesterday when we were at yeah. the cars and coffee. Yeah. We had two supers in a row at the oh. street. That's. Uh, you can't help it. You're just like, oh my gosh, what's like, happening? It's years back since I saw two supers on the street. On the street. We got three at the yeah. end. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, so that's Ola Jaeger, but we're going to ask him something else. Ola, what makes you rad? I think that I came all the way here just to compete in something that I dream about, uh, and uh, yeah, yep. going all always hard. That is definitely what makes you rad, and many more things also. Um, well, that was Ola Jaeger. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed learning more about him, and you're gonna get to see more of him. He's gonna also do a couple episodes of him working on his car here, so you get to see everything about Ola, get to know him real well and follow him throughout this season. So, tell him your Instagram. Follow my Instagram, Ola Jaeger. And then go check him out, follow him and watch him go through this season and everything on Instagram. And then we'll keep you updated on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe guys. Thanks for watching, see you guys. Thanks for watching, see ya.